So uh, this one, again, builds on earlier research from previous years, uh, advancing things. It relates to number six, the cross-site port attack. Uh, this is entitled here, Poning uh, SSR via SSRF. And SSRF is another acronym to the uh, web security vernacular called server-side request forgery. Again, it's a way to get the web server or a remote server to make requests on your behalf, to proxy, as it will. So SSRF, uh, what Alexander did here is he looked at all the research uh, on these sorts of attacks, and he made a taxonomy at it because he felt they were, the rest were kind of limited and didn't fully explore the scope of the entirety of the problem. So he looked at everything, not only HTTP, uh, but uh, SMB relays and all sorts of things, and even looked at XML. So given our time constraints, I'm going to spend five minutes on this stuff and blaze through it. So let's look at slide 62 and see where he went with this stuff here. Uh, just a little bit of history. Um, the history of the first SSRF attack anybody uh, is aware of, the best research we have, is an SMB replay attack by a gentleman by the name of Daryl Heelan, and he did this back in uh, 2008. You can read all the research here. Later, there were later attacks beyond that, and they had to do with both, uh, you know, HTTP-based stuff with XML external entity attacks and things like that. But what I want to do is I want to go over again slide number 63 and show the basic attack flow, which may or may not have anything to do with HTTP. So if you notice the diagram, it's uh, you know the three even four tier network. You have everybody outside the corporate network. And you can, if you can try to connect into these corporate devices, you really can't because a firewall will prevent you. But if you can get that little server in the center there, the port 80 or the mail server or whatever the case may be, to, to uh, take a request from you and forward on another packet internally, that's what you're looking for. So you can say, you can send packet A to service A, your vulnerable server, and then the vulnerable server, service A, will then initiate a packet D to service B, your real intended target, which might be on the ERP network or the industrial network or whatever it can get to. Where the, the variance of the attacks come from is that when you can manipulate some of the fields, some or all the fields from packet B from packet A. So basically, the first request that you send in is able to modify what the server will send on from then on, uh, from then on out. So you can exploit vulnerabilities on the inside of the firewall. Again, this is almost eerily similar to the internet, browser intranet hack, but, the, but you're using servers instead of browsers. So you can force a vulnerable server to file, you know, forward on file include attacks for PHP, SQL injection, external entity attacks, and so on. On slide 64, we can see the new taxonomy that Alexander put together, and it's actually pretty good. It's comprehensive, but also extremely complicated. Um, you can say there's, there's trusted, uh, uh, FSS, SSRF attacks, it's going to get difficult to say that. This is when the remote server uh, has a trusted relationship between other particular services, so it'll just blindly accept whatever you're sending. Uh, you can do remote SSRF attacks, and basically when this is wide open, when the server will connect to anything that you want. Um, you have the simple remote stuff where you have very little control over packet B, the second request, the actual attack payload that you're sending. You have partial remote where you can control some fields in it, and this is some similar to what we saw in version 6 where you can modify in HTTP the path that you're sending on to the secondary server. The taxonomy of uh, server-side uh, SSRF attacks. So we went to the taxonomy, we did simple, we did partial, and we did full remote. What I want to do next is I want to go over some examples here really, really quickly. Um, uh, in the on slide 65, you can see trusted SSRF examples when you happen to be on a MySQL server. So let's say you did a SQL injection on a web server, and you might not have all the permissions that you want on the server, but you're on it. You can send some queries. You might want to use that SQL server to then start uh, fingerprinting or exploiting later exploiting a server on another one. So you can issue this SQL statement here. You can do a select star open query on host B and just get its version number. And so you get just a little bit of trusted SSRF attacks that way. You can do a very similar attack uh, using Oracle. Uh, let's move on to slide number 66. Um, there was another particular vulnerability that was, that was shown off by uh, Alexander. Very cool stuff. It was an SAP net, NetWeaver and a feature called IPC pricing. And in the, in the IPC pricing URL, just a little JSP, it has a server parameter and a port parameter. 
So the server parameter, you can just start you know, putting whatever IP that you want and whatever port that you want. And you can use this little feature here for simple remote SSRF, very simple internal or external port scanning, uh, whatever you want to do there, similar to the cross-site port attack. But it shows that this is possible using the server behind the firewall using you know, these business critical applications. Let's go to slide 67 because here's where it gets really interesting here when we talk about uh, XML external entity tunneling. There's a lot of web servers out there or services online that will take posted XML data and do something with it. So it's not just straight up post things or new URL parameters. They'll take post data in the form of XML. And in the XML, you can actually put something called an external entity. And you can see it there on the fourth line of the code where it does a system command and it asks the system to do a gopher request on some internal port with a payload of a whole bunch of days. And a vulnerable server will absolutely initiate this and actually send an internal request using the gopher protocol with an all A's payload. So let me show you the diagram on the next slide and see how this works and how this looks uh, for the defenders in the crowd. So in the green, you'll see the actual web request you're sending to the server, whatever it is that you're sending, the vulnerable application, and the payload that you're sending. In the red, you can see the gopher payload there. It hits the server, and the server will then fire a gopher payload, a gopher packet, to an internal IP on the 172 network and bridge the gap there with a payload. Normal connections could not get in by the perimeter firewall, but you, you tunnel it this way using, uh, using XML, and you're off to the races. Again, very powerful from an XML attack-related standpoint. Cool for web services. Now, the next step in sophistication on slide 69 is when you use this, tar this sort of functionality and this access to perform buffer overflow attacks. And the example that was used was doing a buffer overflow attack on Virtual Forge in the ABAP kernel. Uh, it was fixed, uh, but this was the general idea. Just for the sake of time, I'm going to move on very quickly to slide number 70 and show you packet B. This is the initial packet that the bad guy will send to the web server, very similar to the one that we saw with the external uh, entity attack. He sends in this packet which has the malicious payload that he wants to send off to his intended target. So it's all wrapped up in this SOAP request. So he then wraps up packet B. This is the one that he wants to have land on the vulnerable web server that he wants to buffer overflow. On the next slide here, he takes packet B and he wraps it up into packet A in the external entity uh, section of the XML here. So this is packet A. So packet A, right to that gopher request, he URL encoded packet B and shoved it all in there and then fired it off to the web server. And that's what you're going to see in slide 72, is that he'll send a post request with the external entity that has the wrapped up packet B, he sends it off to server A, server A unwraps it, unpacks it, sends a gopher request with the exploit payload of packet B, and it sends it on to the, uh, to the web server as intended target. And the payload as it will exploit the system, perform the buffer overflow, and then he uses a DNS tunneling to get the data back out because that web server might not be able to communicate through the firewall and any other channels except routing back over DNS. Very cool stuff. Again, it's almost as if uh, external firewalls really don't exist anymore because everything's interpreting data and we're tunneling data and protocols over other protocols. Port 80 is always open. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm going to uh, just briefly cover the counterattack. One of the things you can also do is when you find a system that w operates like this where you send in an XML entity attack or uh, a port scan attack, what you can do is get that remote service, the vulnerable s system, and connect it back out to a server the bad guy controls. And what the bad guy can do is force back down a whole bunch of malicious payload. So again, if, if they have a jar parser connecting back out to you, you can send in a whole bunch of Java uh, data back down to it and exploit it that way. If it's expecting HTTP data, you can send a, a zip bomb or a gzip bomb back down to it. So it's a way for the attacker to get back into the chain if he wants to exploit the web server using payloads that way.